Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Advancing Mode Options in Managed Lane Projects. My name is Deborah Rouse, and I'll be helping facilitate today's webinar. This webinar is sponsored by the Federal Highway Administration and is hosted by the National Operations Center of Excellence, also known as NOCOE. As a quick reminder, if you don't know already, at NOCOE, we offer a variety of resources to support the transportation systems management and operations community. To cover a few logistics for today's webinar, we are recording this webinar, and the recording, along with the presentation slides, will be available through the on-demand learning section of our website. All the attendees' phones are on listen-only mode by default, but we'd like you to stay engaged by using the question pod for comments and questions. We will have a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. So if you have any questions, we encourage you to enter them in the pod as they come to your mind. The questions will be read out loud one at a time by the moderator, and our presenters will answer each question. So that is all I have, and now I will hand it over to our moderators, Eric Schreckler and Jim Hunt, to start us off. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much, Deborah. This is Jim. I'll um, I'll start and then tag team with with Eric here in a bit. Um, first, want to say thank you to the Operations Center of Excellence uh, for their you know continued partnership and helping us uh, spread the word on some of the uh, new initiatives from the Federal Highway Administration programs, as well as allowing us to bring in some some great um, practitioner speakers for these webinars. Um, this is one of two webinars in the series, and Eric will discuss uh, or at least highlight the other uh, in a bit. Um, so the focus today is on managed lanes, and particularly in the context of how multimodal options and, and kind of emerging travel services can be integrated with, within the managed lane framework um, to better link and complement one another to improve overall system performance. Um, so I'll, I'll provide some introductory comp remarks and then, uh, as I said, turn it over to to Eric, who's a, a, a subcontractor on the ICF team. ICF is providing support to FHWA in this area. What, what we're generally referring to as contemporary approaches to managing travel demand. Um, so for, for a while, I'm in the Office of Operations in Federal Highway, and we've, we've recognized managed lane as a key strategy under the TISMO umbrella, the Transportation Systems Management and Operations kind of rubric. Um, but what's changed in recently for, for managed lane concepts as well as a variety of TISMO strategies is the recognition that more and more uh, a lot of the TDM approaches are being tightly, more tightly connected with operations. Um, some, and, and, and in some ways, they're almost uh, indistinguishable from is something a, a TDM measure or is it a, uh, an operational performance measure. Uh, and some of the trends that are driving that that the merging of those two two worlds are what you see on the slide here. Um, the availability of increasingly real-time, dynamic, even predictive um, traveler information, the fact that travelers are having uh, increasing availability of information that cut across modes, um, especially too with the younger generation, there's less of a less of a, an affiliation to a particular mode and more about uh, you know, trying to achieve the best mobility services regardless of, um, of, the, of the various legs in that chain from getting from origin to destination. And the emergence of new services and, and uh, of course, micromobility, mobility on demand, uh, mobility as a service, um, the use of behavioral economics to influence uh, or at least um, motivate behavior change. So all these kind of areas are kind of coalescing. So we thought in our operations areas, we need to kind of reflect some of these emerging uh, TDM concepts as well. Um, kind of highlights a little bit of what I, what I just gave an overview of. It's the convergence of, you can, you can separate the um, kind of the topics or the, uh, the emphasis areas in these different bins. You have infrastructure related components, and you see managed lanes fits there, but it obviously also fits under um, services and policies. But you know, the, the merging of infrastructure, uh, infrastructure, technology, policies, services, the use of um, incentives, and in, in, in this webinar, we'll talk a little bit about you know, using um, um, incentivizing carpool and transit use, and again, trying to look at the holistic approach to managing the system 
um, as well as how to, you know, toll revenue from managed lands could be used to support some of these other modes and, and, and approaches. Um, so today we want to kind of the question we pose to ourselves and to our speakers is kind of how can some of these emerging mobility or contemporary TDM approaches um, kind of complement and fill objectives for managed lanes. So that kind of variety of ways that maybe can be done as shown in the bullets here, um, in connection with mobility on demand, looking at um, subsidizing and pricing uh, op options, enhanced use of, of multimodal travel information. So again, some of our speakers will hit on, um, on some of these points as, as we go forward. Um, one important, I guess, as I said, we're trying to merge the world of travel demand management and transportation systems management and operations. And one important, um, I guess, uh, uh, model to think of is just, just what, how have we historically tried to approach each of those, each of those silos in, in a sense. So users and, and those involved with um, TDM programs have recognized the importance of really targeting targeting their programs to specific uh, users by, by making it clear as to what the choices are, how different options um, would be more convenient, um, price sensitivity, time sensitivity, so those things that really hit home to the individual traveler, whereas those involved in managing the system would kind of look at aggregate measures of uh, traffic flow, reliability, system safety, system resilience, but, you know, as, again, as we go forward, these some of these merging concepts and approaches and services are really blending these two together. So we're seeing more um, exciting activities in the TDM world to recognize more of these real-time system management strategies, as well as the system management operations folks seeing that it's not just about managing vehicles, but it's about um, providing good information and coordinating with other modes to, to improve the system. Uh, so today, uh, the purpose is to provide an understanding of some of these other approaches and how they can be used to um, kind of link to the managed lanes activities, strengthen the linkages between traffic operations, travel demand management. As I said, they've historically been very independent, um, but more and more we see opportunities to, to bridge those gaps. Uh, private sector planning and operations is all different stakeholders that are now you know, talking more and more with one another. So the presentations, so we're going to have three presentations today, excellent, excellent presenters, um, different parts of the country, Northern California, Southern California, and, um, and the Northern Virginia, D.C. area, and, and ways in which they're maximizing or thinking about maximizing the, the uh, efficiency of their managed lanes project through some of these broader approaches and services. I'll let uh, Ben, Silva, and Mary kind of won't steal their thunder here, but um, that's what's coming up. But first, I, Eric is going to, well, I guess there's two, two more. I just wanted to mention uh, where some of our resources have been placed and some of our um, kind of foundational uh, publications. Here's a slide that shows covers from various travel demand management. Um, in, in the first one on the left there is integrating PDM into the transportation planning process. Got a few down the bottom dealing with uh, shared use mobility from an equity standpoint, as well as just a national scan of the various services in, in that in that space. Um, more recent work is looking at the bottom right is the kind of the topic that I touched on, which was the link linkages, strengthening the linkages between TDM and traffic management, and various case studies are um, used there. And then there's one on the um, upper right, which is also fairly recent, that talks about the ways in which incentives and behavioral economics have been used to improve transportation performance. There's the link for those resources, as well as kind of three of our um, landing pages for a lot of this work on active transportation demand management programs. This kind of cuts across different different programs. Active transportation demand management, the travel demand management webpage, and then this notion we've come up with is the capability maturity framework. So for a variety of areas within operations, uh, I think there are seven up there now, agencies can kind of self-evaluate their, their um, kind of baseline where they are in, in areas of organizational strength. And we just developed one with the help of the ICF team oh, in the last six months or so that, that covers a lot of the issues we'll talk about today in, in integrating TDM and traffic management. And that's the link for it there. 
Um, just want to mention that uh, this, as like I said in the beginning, this is one of two webinars um, under this under this project. There's going to be another one that's focused on you know, some of these emerging mobility concepts as well, but in particular how they've been applied in uh, resort towns and communities, so kind of like ski areas or, or summer uh, destinations. So we're still trying to finalize the speakers for that, but um, there's the link for it for, for that particular webinar. We will not be through the center of excellence, it will be uh, through a different um, um, platform. And then just to mention two grant opportunities um, that are currently on the street for um, USDOT, um, both of which might have you know, um, uh, relationship to some of the topics we're going to talk about today. So we just wanted to make, you know, spread the word on, um, on, those, on those solicitations that are currently active. I think with that, I'll turn it over to Eric to provide a little more detail on what we mean by contemporary TDM, its dimensions, and its relationships to um, mobility on demand and other related topics. Did we? Eric, are you able to advance or do you need assistance? Jim, can you hear maybe me? you should go. Yeah, Jim, maybe you should go ahead. <laughs> I didn't know if I was lost or Eric. I thought. I no, back. okay. Um, so, okay. Welcome, Eric. Jim, can, can you hear me? On the web, too? Jim, yeah. can you hear me? You have yeah. the... Coming across to me, Eric. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going and, and somebody jump in. I'm having internet problems. We can hear you. Great, thank you so much. Sorry about that. Uh, thanks to the National Center and, and for the great speakers we're about to have and for the 128 people that are listening in. really appreciate that. Um, today we're focusing on the potential role of contemporary demand management strategies on improving the effectiveness of managed lanes. And of course, throughout the U.S., HOV lanes have been converted to high occupancy toll or hot lanes, and other lanes have been constructed as express lanes, allowing SOVs to buy reliable travel times and provide free or discounted use to HOV users. However, the treatment and experience with carpools and managed lanes varies. And I also want to mention there is another federal highway project that's just started called Maintaining an HOV Emphasis for Managed Lane Projects um, that's being handled out of the FXWE Resource Center, and there'll be a report coming out in 2021 on this very topic. So let's see if I can move the slides. Yay! So why should we encourage alternative mode use and managed lanes? Well, you know, it's largely to increase person throughput, more people and fewer vehicles. But we also want to maximize traveler choices, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And there's also some question as to the environmental impacts of managed lanes and increasing vehicle occupancy does have the potential to reduce VMT and therefore help mitigate emissions. Now, the way that Federal Highways has been conceptualizing uh, uh, managing demand and its impact on specific facilities in the system is through the trip chain. So even though the ultimate use of a managed, uh, of a priced lane, either as a uh, single driver or as in a carpool is sort of at the right hand of this conceptual framework, uh, people make choices uh, before that and we can actively manage the system before, during, at the end of the trip chain. So obviously we can impact destination choice. Uh, we need to be aware of what, um, uh, what travelers, what destinations they choose. Parking management can come into this. The time of day outside of peak periods. Obviously carpooling, uh, vanpooling transit has to do with mode choice, but also which uh, road or transit route to be taken um, based on fastest, directest, most cost effective, and then ultimately the lane or facility choice 
um, and this may involve options related uh, to uh, to manage liens uh, and hot liens as well. So this is a way really that that um, Federal Highways has been thinking about how to integrate some of these earlier choices to influence how a facility like a managed lane might work. Now, mobility on demand is something that uh, we've uh, we've included uh, in the whole uh, rubric of managing demand, of managing the system, and uh, Federal Highways defines mobility on demand as a safe, reliable, and carefree mobility ecosystem that supports complete trips for all, back to that trip chain, both for personalized mobility and goods and delivery. Uh, the transportation mobility landscape is changing uh, with mobility on demand, and it's uh, really changing both due to infrastructure capabilities, and a lot of it has to do with uh, technology. And the concept when applied to managed lane projects can help conceptualize how to adjust this changing landscape to manage traveler choices. So how can we provide more and better choices to travelers? Well, first, actively managing the system at a given facility can help to dynamically respond to varying types and levels of demand. Active is the key term there. Microtransit and other on-demand services can help address first and last mile issues. Dynamic parking management can also help manage demand at the destination end. And priority treatment of carpools and transit via HOV and hot lanes can provide travel time savings for these travelers. And we can even envision the use of automated shuttles to help feed transportation terminals. But the most common way to promote alternative modes has proven to be incentives and targeted marketing. And we'll hear from each of our speakers about how they're doing this. So for travel choices to be effective, the traveler or potential traveler must be aware of the available choices. Do I know what parking is available? Do I know if bike sharing exists? Um, they'd be able to make the choice in a convenient manner and be able to trust the reliability of the choice. And that reliability is important both in managed lanes in terms of the travel experience, but also in the other choices that might be made other than driving alone. We've also realized that effective choices requires new and improved partnerships to make this happen. And here are some examples of what these various partnerships uh, can produce. The private sector and the traveler through new rideshare apps can provide new options, shared mobility, incentives. Public to public uh, uh, is uh, really looking at the way that different agencies and providers interact and uh, the public and private uh, solutions with first and last mile solutions and incentives. So really the opportunity that we have um, is using this contemporary view of demand management and to provide reliable, safe travel options and choices in an equitable manner, and to leverage the synergies between programs that, as Jim said, have been historically siloed, and adapt to the changing environment that is blurring these lines by providing a framework for advancing integrated, holistic travel management programs. So that in a way of some background of what the overall Federal Highway Project is about, we now wanna focus more on real life experience with advancing mode options with managed lanes. And our first presenter will be uh, Ben Owen um, from Northern Virginia to talk a little bit about the uh, Commuter Choice Program that they have on uh, a couple of facilities in Northern Virginia. Ben? All right, thanks. Um, good afternoon to most of you. Good morning to a few of you uh, on the West Coast. Happy to be part of today's webinar. Um, I manage the Commuter Choice Program for the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission. We're based in Arlington, just outside Washington, D.C. Today I'll be giving you an overview of our Commuter Choice Program, which is, I believe, our nationally unique program that reinvests toll revenues from managed lane facilities into multimodal transportation improvements in those corridors on a competitive basis. So first, a bit of background, who we are at NVTC. Um, we're one of the few entities in Northern Virginia that provide funding support for transit in our area, but we also have roles as an overseer and as a convener around transit matters for our member jurisdictions, as well as the Commonwealth of Virginia, which, fun fact, is one of four Commonwealth states in the United States. 
a lot of what we do is around the regional Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority system in terms of providing funding and oversight on behalf of the Commonwealth. We co-own the Virginia Railway Express commuter rail system with our neighbor commission to the south. We support local or more accurately, accurately jurisdictional bus systems in our district with funding and planning and other technical assistance. And finally, the focus of today's presentation, the Commuter Choice Program. So what is Commuter Choice? Uh, it's a funding program created by the Commonwealth and managed regionally by us with local jurisdictions and transit providers as eligible applicants and recipients. <clears throat> there is a corridor level focus to the program, specifically on two expressways in our region where tolls are collected. I'll describe both of these more in a moment. Uh, the two corridors have slightly different governing frameworks and different characteristics, but we've worked to make policy between them as consistent as possible. We can fund a broad range of multimodal improvements under the program. These include new and expanded transit services. Any project we fund must contribute to maximizing person throughput in the corridor and fostering multimodal improvements that will improve travel and expand options for commuters. Closely related to these goals is the need to benefit toll payers in each corridor. Virginia legal precedent and statute clearly establish tolls as user fees whose applications need to benefit the people paying them. And the clearest indication of this for us is a plausible estimate of the number of additional people that the project would move through the corridor each morning. I'll talk more about the funding arrangements in each corridor, but for the moment, the key point is, you know, we're talking in both corridors about a long-term and steady investment in both. And while overall this is a small and targeted piece of transportation funding in Northern Virginia, it is an important one because both of these routes are major commuter corridors in the area. So the first of the two corridors was Interstate 66 between the Beltway, I-495, and the Washington, D.C. line. Uh, the facility is approximately 10 miles long. This segment of interstate, when it opened in the early 1980s, was fairly unique in that it had peak period, peak direction use, largely limited to high occupancy vehicles. That restriction was replaced in 2017 with peak period, peak direction tolling with exemptions for HOVs. As part of the local negotiations for this change, as well as a widening of a portion of I-66, a portion of the toll revenues collected were to be set aside for multimodal improvements. So that was really the genesis of commuter choice. And projects we support don't have to physically touch the corridor, but at least have to feed people into it. The Virginia Department of Transportation administers the tolling along I-66 inside the Beltway, and we receive a defined maximum amount after VDOT deducts their operating and maintenance costs of the tolling equipment. We have a 40-year payout schedule for the corridor uh, that's flagging a little bit right now due to um, significantly less travel as a result of the COVID-19 public health emergency. In terms of corridor characteristics, about 65% of peak period trips in this corridor are by means other than SOV. Um, the western suburbs of the DC region extend quite a bit beyond the Beltway and commuters heading into and through this corridor. Many are headed to the inner portion of Arlington in the corridor where there are approximately 90,000 jobs, the Pentagon, which has alone about 25,000 jobs, and downtown DC. And there are extensive transit options, including Metro Rail, a growing number of point-to-point -point commuter bus routes that we're supporting through Commuter Choice and many local bus services. And I'll talk in a moment about um, more about what we've supported in terms of projects. Our second corridor came online last year. This is I-95 and 395, which has a continuous 37-mile reversible high-occupancy toll facility from the DC line into Stafford County. Um, it's in the process of being extended further south. We manage this program in collaboration with our neighbor commission to the south, uh, the Potomac and Rappahannock Transportation Commission, because it's such a long route. Um, funding for multimodal improvements here was established with the conversion of the eight miles of what were HOV lanes along I-395 in the inner portion of the corridor between the Beltway and DC line into high occupancy toll lanes. So the money here comes from um, an annual payment from the Express Lanes concessionaire, Transurban, as part of their master agreement with the Commonwealth. 
And in this corridor, our funding extends for a whopping 68 years. Key commuter destinations in this corridor are downtown DC, the Pentagon, as well as three other large military facilities that have about 115,000 personnel total. About 60% of peak period trips through the inner portion of the corridor are non-SOV. Um, there's commuter rail in this corridor. There's also two metro rail lines further in. And a lot of HOVs, which have free access to the express lanes, this corridor was also um, kind of known for having a well-established casual carpooling or slugging culture going back to the 1970s. We funded one round of projects in this corridor so far. And one thing I'll just note, an emphasis in the first round of funding in both corridors was on supporting strategies that could be in place by the time that tolling began to show quick benefits. After continual refinements, we've reached an evaluation process that we intend to keep in place for a while. Um, the scoring approach in general is well understood by our commission and has largely been the basis for their funding decisions. However, they and ultimately the Commonwealth Transportation Board have the final say in how projects are prioritized for funding. So we've been working to make the technical part of the process as objective as we can. Most of the possible points relate to the corridor improvement goals, namely how efficiently proposed projects move more people, as well as the attractiveness and viability of transportation alternatives that they're creating. We also look at cost effectiveness, basically uh, in terms of technical merit score bang for the buck. Uh, we have an applicant preference criterion that allows each applicant to identify their top priority project and receive points for it, which um, in part helps the commission avoid having to um, wade into geographic distribution quandaries, and then a small interagency collaboration criterion, basically looking to see if applicants have talked with other entities or agencies in the region that might have reason to care about the project. Ongoing performance management is an important aspect of the program. We require annual performance reports from our recipients on performance measures relating to um, how many, like what the actual throughput improvement has been. And we also need to begin reporting annually to the Commonwealth on the extent to which projects we've funded are delivering their expected benefits. <clears throat> so what have we funded? Well, over 80% of our funding so far has gone to newer expanded bus services, both local and commuter. Um, this $51 million does include capital improvements, such as bus purchases, park and ride lot construction, and bus stop improvements. We funded one um, kind of innovative on-demand shuttle project so far, but generally this is pretty traditional meat and potatoes bus service. Commuter services have generally scored and performed well. Um, local service improvements have been something of a mixed bag. Not surprisingly, the more substantial um, the improvement or the more needed from a demand perspective, the more substantial the ridership gain. Um, while we can support most services indefinitely overall, we fund at most two years of operations at a time. This gives us and recipients an out if something isn't performing well. So when services come back, they need to recompete successfully against other projects. We've funded a uh, handful of TDM campaigns and strategies to date, mostly traditional employer and resident-based campaigns as well as means of providing information for commuters, as well as one on-demand van pool matching project. A general challenge with TDM for us is reconciling the longer-term incremental nature of traditional campaigns with the need to show quantifiable near-term benefits attributable to our investment. We've funded a few projects around access to transit and roadway operations. They're just combined here because they're our smallest categories. Um, and this is partly a function of our evaluation process that emphasizes strategies that expand throughput significantly and efficiently. So in terms of access to transit, most of what we've supported so far has been bike share expansion and other improved non-motorized access to transit stops and stations. We've had a few nibbles of interest around on-demand options, usually from specific technology platforms. However, they can't apply for funding directly from us, and our recipients are required to conduct competitive procurements, which adds some complexity and obviously dampens individual platforms' interest when they can't be sure they'll benefit from the funding. We do support ITS, TSM, and other corridor roadway projects. Um, so far, 
just a couple limited ITS and traffic management center upgrades um, along parallel routes to I-66 in Arlington. I alluded earlier to the need to be able to measure the benefits of our funding, <clears throat> and one way that we're doing this is with biennial traffic and transit ridership counts in each corridor to capture changes over time in throughput and mode share. We did our first such comparison for the I-66 corridor last year, comparing 2015 and 2019 counts, so before and after tolling and initial transit and other multimodal improvements coming online. Overall, these, in these interventions did move the needle. Um, about 1% more people moving along I-66 and parallel arterial and transit routes during the morning peak, and about 3% fewer vehicles. The growth in commuter bus ridership was significant and can be attributed almost exclusively to our funding support. This 26% growth translates to about 550 more morning trips. But still, um, commuter buses are a relatively small piece of the transportation puzzle in the corridor. Rail accounts for the um, overwhelming majority of transit trips. However, we found that metro rail ridership grew over the same period that these new commuter bus services were coming online. Generally, the commuter bus routes either begin well beyond the end of the rail network, such that the alternative would be a connecting bus ride to a rail station or driving to that station and paying for parking, or the buses provide a one-seat ride between origin destination pairs, um, such as the Pentagon, that would require a connection, uh, making a transfer in route by rail. So to wrap up, what have we learned and where are we going? Well, our bread and butter projects so far have been commuter and express bus services, but even before COVID, we were facing potential saturation of this market. These types of projects have been among the easiest for our eligible applicants to propose for a few reasons. For one, many of them operate transit service. For another, they can take project proposals from the regular system plans that they have to develop for the Commonwealth. Third, we fund expansion buses, and fourth, the projects generally score well. Um, besides, uh, you know, potential, uh, at least short-term demand reductions as a result of sort of COVID fallout, we also are facing a one-time situation that many of our I-66 commuter bus mainstays will be transitioning to other state funding in the next couple of years. So we have long-term payout schedules and want to make sure we have a, you know, robust set of project proposals to choose from. So we really see growing needs for more creativity and also engagement with applicants to foster more diverse proposals that fit well with the program. We've started to see a shift toward capital proposals, such as second entrances at a couple of rail stations. We want to encourage these kinds of proposals as these have the means to benefit corridor commuters in the long run. Our applicants have asked us to engage with them more during application periods, and we're working on ways to be a better resource for them. Fit with the program can be a challenge, just given the niche requirements, particularly the need to demonstrate benefit, benefits to toll payers. We've also been incrementally building out program policy in ways that we feel we need to in order to provide proper stewardship of the funds, but this adds complexity. I mentioned that we haven't had, I think I mentioned, that we haven't done many pro projects yet around innovative technology and ride matching or first and last mile connections. There are plenty of platforms and at least some local interest, but given the competitive procurement requirements under the program, there's kind of a missing piece in terms of bringing these together without potentially favoring certain vendors. So we're not quite sure yet what the best solution is here and we're very open to ideas. And finally, as part of our performance management for the program, we need to begin reporting on the extent to which efforts we funded have delivered their expected benefits and identify strategies to address those that haven't. The clearest metric for our projects is how many additional people they're actually moving through the corridor relative to their target at the time of application. This is most challenging with TDM campaigns where the main measurement tool we've stipulated so far has been a regional travel behavior survey of commuters. So going forward, we're proposing to limit TDM activities to those where the ridership impacts are directly measurable. And that wraps up my remarks. Thank you. And I think we are taking questions at the end of the presentations.
Hello, everyone. My name is Silva Margarosian. Um, I am a Senior Transportation Planning Manager at Metro. I handle the customer service portion of the operations. Um, today, I will be speaking about some of the programs we offer our customers and the communities along the express lanes to improve numerous modes of transportation. So to give you guys a little bit of a background, the express lanes um, was a pilot one-year demonstration project. It converted existing carpool lanes on the 10 and 110 to a high occupancy toll lanes. The goal of this demonstration project was to enhance travel options and ease congestion on two of LA County's busiest freeways. The first express lanes open, opened in November of 2012 on the 110 and the second in February of 2013 on the 10. The Metro Board approved continuation of the Metro Express Lanes beyond the demonstration period in 2015. So for funding for this demonstration was provided by a $210 million grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation. This grant funding was used to introduce congestion pricing for these hot lanes, um, improve transit service along the two corridors, update transit facilities, and improve parking stations for transit users. So some of the major improvements this grant funded was the El Monte Transit Center expansion, a direct connector for buses at Union Station. Numerous enhancements were made to the I-110 Harbor Gateway Station with signage, lighting, and security cameras. The objective to these improvements was to attract travelers who would otherwise drive to use transit. It was also a question of equity. The investment made to transit and the stations would allow the low-income commuters to benefit substantially. Improvements were made, were made to quality, safety, accessibility, and transit service, allowing all commuters to have options when traveling to downtown Los Angeles. So Metro's tolling authority for the express lanes demonstration project um, authorized Senate Bill 1422. SB 1422 required Metro to study the impact of the demonstration program on low-income commuters and wanted us to develop ways to provide low-income commuters the same opportunity to use toll lanes as other commuters. To that end, Metro completed a study and developed the low-income assistance plan. This mitigation program was the first of its kind in the state of California. Residents of Los Angeles County with an annual household income equal to or less than double the federal poverty level, qualified for a one-time $25 credit and an automatic waiver of their monthly account maintenance fee. The credit um, can be used to be applied to either the transponder deposit or the prepaid toll amount, the, the prepaid toll balance. Um, this slide shows the number of accounts we have had since implementation. As you can see, the low-income accounts have definitely, definitely increased. To date, 3% of the total accounts we have um, are low-income assistance plan accounts. But as a department, we are working towards increasing the account numbers. Therefore, every year we set aside revenue dollars to market and outreach um, and, market, and market and outreach the low-income assistance plan in an effort to increase customer participation. The outreach we have done to date are uh, Metro bus cards. We've done field surveys. We distribute brochures at social service centers and different community events. Um, we've had billboards throughout LA County and bus shelters that advertise the program. We've done um, TV digital displays at McDonald's throughout LA County gas pump toppers, um, we've done media buy on local radio stations, and mall advertising at food courts and common space areas. We also have our transit rewards program. The purpose of this rewards program is to promote multi-mode traveling. We are leveraging congestion pricing with transit to ensure viable, high quality alternative to those customers that are traveling alone and paying a toll. The goal is to improve transit service and incentivize so that transit riders would continue using the bus as opposed to shifting over to becoming solo drivers. This program represents another form of mitigation on impact of commuters of low income. So transit riders who are also Metro Express Lane account holders have the opportunity to earn a $5 toll credit to use on the 10 and 110 Express Lanes. 
To receive this toll credit, transit riders must use their registered TAP card and take 16 one-way trips during peak hours on certain transit lines. Currently, we have 17 lines along the 10 and 110 which qualify for this program. The Carpool Loyalty Program is another incentive program we offer. Basically, carpoolers are automatically entered into a monthly drawing for a chance to win toll credits. Um, about $1,000 in toll credits per, per month are given back to carpoolers. Finally, we have the Net Toll Revenue Grant Program. In the past, to execute this grant program, we created an expenditure plan. So gross toll revenues from the Express Lanes program are first used to cover the direct expense related to maintenance, administration, and operation of the program. Any remaining revenue produced is used in the corridor for which it was generated um, through this grant. The, the net toll revenue program's primary objective is to increase mobility and person, person throughput via implementation of integrated strategies that enhance transit operations, transportation demand management, transportation systems management, active transportation, and capital invest investments along the 110 and 10 corridors. To date, we have allocated about $80 million in, in this expenditure plan. With this $80 million, we have set aside funds for reserve. We have paid for transit operating subsidy to numerous transit agencies that provide service along our corridors. We have provided funds to Caltrans for maintenance. And then the remaining funds are granted on a competitive basis through the Net Toll Revenue Grant Program. To be eligible for this grant, applicants must be public agencies that provide transportation facilities or services within LA County. The project or program must be within three miles on either side of the 110 or 10 corridor. We have allocated $48.6 million to be reinvested back into the corridor where these revenues were generated. So, so far we've had two rounds. For round one of this grant, the Metro Board approved 22 projects, totaling $22.7 million. And in round two, we had 21 projects approved, totaling $27.8 million. And the funds available for, for allocation for the grant program are distributed into three categories. Um, the first is transit use. We have allocated and approved 15 projects. Eligible projects include transit operations to increase level of service. We have fare subsidies, bus purchases, station enhancements. Um, we funded the Dodger Stadium Express. Gardena, Torrance, and Commuter Express have all um, received funding for transit service. Um, City of Baldwin Park had a transit service expansion, and um, we funded a transit vehicle purchase such as a double-decker bus for Foothill Transit. For roadway and highway improvements, we have allocated and approved 10 projects. So those eligible projects include intelligent transportation system improvements, deck rehab and maintenance, um, we fund on and off ramp improvements, expanded freeway service patrol, and graffiti removal and landscaping. And to date, we have funded the South Bay Arterial Performance Measurements, um, Communication System Enhancement for a City of LA Project, and the Caltrans Incident Management Improvement Project. Um, finally, the system connectivity and active transportation project, we have allocated and approved 16 projects for this mode. Um, the projects include first last mile connections to transit facilities, um, complete street projects, bicycle infrastructure, pedestrian enhancements, and bus station improvements. And to date, we funded the Union, Sen Union Station Metro Bike Hub the Monterey Park bike, par, um, bike corridor improvements, and the bike share in downtown Los Angeles. Um, that completes my presentation. Mary, I think you're next. Hi, and thank you, Silva. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Mary Thomas Meyer, and I work for Commute.org, the Transportation Demand Management Agency for San Mateo County in the San Francisco Bay Area. 
To give you a quick overview, today I will briefly explain who commute.org is. I'll describe the express lanes coming to our county and then talk about our incentive program that encourages carpooling. As I said, commute.org is the TDM agency for San Mateo County. We're a public agency with the mission to reduce the number of single occupancy vehicles traveling to, from, and through the county thereby reducing emissions and improving air quality. We offer a mix of services and programs, such as first and last mile shuttles and reward programs, to encourage commuters to use non-SOV modes. San Mateo County is located between San Francisco and Silicon Valley. US 101 is the major freeway that runs through San Mateo County connecting those two areas. It's a busy corridor that gets quite congested due to the daily vehicle demand, bridge connections, and access to San Francisco International Airport. After looking into various options, Caltrans, the California Department of Transportation, determined express lanes as the most effective means to address traffic congestion along the corridor. The $580 million multi-agency project aims to support ride sharing and transit use while achieving faster, more reliable travel speeds of 45 miles per hour or greater. Project funding is a mix of local, regional, state, and federal funds, but a majority of it comes from California's Senate Bill 1, which is the Road Repair and Accountability Act. I won't go into too much detail here, but this just gives you an idea of the project's timeline. Construction began in early 2019 and is scheduled to be completed by the end of 2022. As of February 2020, they were on to phase two of the project with construction of the new part of the express lanes, but it's unclear if the uh, pandemic has had any impact on the schedule. The lanes span 22 miles total, nine of which were converted from HOV lanes and 13 of which are new. Expected increase in person throughput is about 200,000, from 600,000 without the express lanes to 800,000 with them. High occupancy vehicles of three or more, as well as transit and shuttles, can travel on the lane toll free. Everyone else will have to pay a toll through the state's electronic toll collection system fast track. I believe two person carpools will just have to pay a reduced toll. Hours of operation will be from 5 a.m. to 8 p.m., and the toll will be a variable rate depending on the traffic volume. I saw somewhere it will be an estimate of $1 per mile, but it could go as high as $3. The Joint Powers Authority that owns the express lanes is still working on an expenditure plan that will determine the use of toll revenues. Some of it will go to cover operation and maintenance costs, and then what's left over can go towards transit improvements, park and ride lots, uh, offset incentive programs and discount programs. So where does commute.org tie in here? Um, our funding agency, the City County Association of Governments of San Mateo County, aka CCAG, happens to be one of the three agencies involved with the Express Lanes project. They approached us in the summer of 2018 wanting to create a new carpool incentive program. Although such a program was not a part of the Express Lane Project's official plan, the project gave us an opportunity and justification for heavily promoting carpooling in the area. Over the past few years, there have been a number of different carpool incentives offered in our service area. Community.org's legacy program was a one-time $50 gas card mailed to people after they submitted an application. There was also CCAG's partnership with Scoop, a carpooling app, to offer subsidized rides and driver bonuses. Then came along the sequel to the previous carpool incentive, Carpool 2.0, sponsored by CCAG and executed by commute.org. It ran from October 2018 through December 2019, and now we're on to Carpool 2020, which is essentially a continuation of 2.0 with some minor changes. For the administration of the program, we decided to use our commute tracking platform run by Ride Amigos, which we call the STAR platform, standing for Support, Track, and Reward. We'd been using it for a few years by the time Carpool 2.0 came around. 
Participants had to track their carpool trip with the Ride Amigos app, or they could connect a Scoop or Waze account to Ride Amigos for automatic trip tracking. Every 10 days they carpooled, they could claim a $25 e-gift card, up to four times for a total of $100. The current Carpool 2020 program is set up the same way, but participants have to use either Waze or Scoop to carpool. We did away with the Ride and Winkos app option. The program is also now annual, so commuters can earn $100 each year. The funding provided to us by CCAD came from the Transportation for Clean Air Fund, which is funded through a fee paid when people register their cars, and goes towards projects aiming to reduce motor vehicle emissions. To promote the program, we relied on social media and outreach to commuters and employers in San Mateo County, in addition to digital billboards on US 101 and direct mail to residents. Our annual symposium for employers in 2019 gave us another opportunity to promote the program since the theme that year was carpooling and vanpooling. Then in the fall of 2019, we did a carpool challenge and participants were entered to win a vacation package. This drew new attention to Carpool 2.0, but also brought back those who received the Carpool Award like months before. For the Carpool 2020 program, we added to our marketing materials a short video tutorial explaining how to participate in the program. At a time when Instagram and TikTok are king, pictures and videos are much more effective than a paragraph or two of words relating the same information. The Ride Amigos platform is quite valuable because of the data we can pull from it and compile into reports. We use those reports and quarterly surveys sent to program participants to assess the program and measure results. We rewarded over 1,900 carpoolers from October 2018 through December 2019. For comparison, our previous carpool incentive program rewarded less than 200 people in the year before Carpool 2.0. The stats you see on the left side are similar to the personal stats commuters can see in their profile. This feature provides immediate feedback to commuters that encourages them to keep up the behavior. These graphs each show something different, but they all have the same trend. You can see that carpool activity on the STAR platform really took off after we launched the program in late 2018. As I mentioned before, the $100 carpool incentive is ongoing. Our funding was renewed, but because of the shelter in place order, carpool activity and commuting in general is way down. We've held off on promoting the program, but will continue marketing when it's deemed appropriate. Right now, we're pushing the carpool safety guidelines from Waze, Scoop, and the Association for Commuter Transportation. This includes limiting a carpool to a driver and one passenger, but we hope we can encourage three plus person pools by the time the express lanes are completed. Thank you for listening and thank you to the Federal Highway Administration and the National Operations Center for Excellence for hosting today. Please reach out if you have any questions or want to talk further about what we did and what we're doing now. Thanks. Okay, so I believe now we will go through the questions. Eric and Jim, you all can go ahead and answer and moderate the questions in the question pod. Okay, uh, this is Jim. I thought so. Eric would jump in, but um, let's do that, Deborah. So the first one I see here is, uh, I guess we're on, on to Ben, and, um, but others feel free to uh, contribute too if you have a perspective. Um, how do you expect carpooling to be affected? Okay, this is kind of related to, Mary just talked a little bit about in her presentation, but um, I'm going to elaborate a little bit from Northern Virginia's perspective on the effects of 
of the, uh, the virus situation moving forward? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, a lot of, we and a lot of our regional partners are kind of trying to figure this sort of thing out too. I know that some of the TDM efforts we've funded, they've been able to kind of pivot to working with companies to establish or advance telework policies, build on policies that were already in place, which, you know, for our purposes is, you know, a car trip saved is essentially equivalent to, you know, an additional person moved through the corridor. Um, I don't know that I have much to say about it beyond that, though. Uh, Silver, do you have any? I mean, add? this is an ongoing issue that Metro is trying to figure out themselves. Um, we had a pilot that we were trying to promote on the 10, which was, um, you know, charging everybody besides for registered samples, and we had to push that back for one year just because of everything that's been going on with um, COVID and how people are scared to couple. So, honestly, I don't think I have an answer. It's just everything's changing every day, so I'm not sure if people are going to be comfortable with carpooling. Thanks, Silva. Uh, next one, I think, then, is back to you. A little more, maybe, elaboration on your evaluation process. Um, how extensively did the metrics get analyzed? I think you said it took a few iterations to get where you are now. And then, you know, is, is it some of those Metrics, are they overall aggregate measures, or is there any, if I'm reading this correctly, any um, kind of disaggregation by, by hour? Does that make sense to you? Yeah, there were a couple questions in there about, um, yeah, the aggregate versus hour by hour, and also how do we evaluate person throughput, so I can kind of tackle those together. Um, we're looking at aggregate, um, well, for throughput in particular, looking at an aggregate over the morning peak period inbound direction. Um, since for I-66, that's the direction in which tolls are being collected at this point. Um, we're doing similar for 395 as well. So, right, when someone reports a throughput estimate to us, that's across the, you know, roughly three or four hour morning peak period. In terms of how we evaluate person throughput, um, our applicants need to estimate that as part of their applications, and we look at those for reasonability. Um, you know, a lot of the transit providers have kind of past experience with launching new services that they can rely on, particularly around new commuter routes. For local services, there's a um, planning sketch model, T-BEST, that we can use to kind of validate the estimates that people give us. The anticipated throughput increase is a term of our project agreements, so our applicants understand that that is something that their projects are going to be measured against and, you know, will sort of serve as a, a metric of how successful they are. Um, in our evaluation, where we have person throughput as a criteria, and what we're really looking at there is the efficiency by which the project is moving more people, so we're comparing the additional number of people to the additional number of vehicles associated with, with those person trips. And then the scoring is done based on sort of a tiered ranking. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, I guess you mentioned a little bit about the small slice of that pie that was going towards ICS type projects, and specifically someone wants to know if transit signal priority was one of the applications that or one of the strategies that, that encompass Nova. Yeah, we haven't funded TSP yet, but it would be eligible. Basically, the ITS um, work that we supported in Arlington was some additional cameras and Bluetooth devices and sensors and that sort of thing to, you know, kind of help um, with incident detection and measuring just the reliability of travel time in the corridor. Um, yeah. Most of the major, most of the somewhat significant roads in the region are owned by the Virginia Department of Transportation, so there is some level of coordination that would need to happen for TSP to be deployed. Okay. And then maybe a couple more related to what's been funded. Um, question about express bus and commuter bus park and ride lots, and if so, any any local 
resistance um, at those facilities? Yeah, so far we've funded a couple park and ride lots, um, construction of one and a couple um, shorter term leases of parking spaces. We're thinking we may see more proposals for these in the future with our you know, efforts to kind of encourage more capital proposals. Um, I don't think we've funded enough yet, or enough contentious ones anyway, to yeah. see that there's been pushback locally. One aspect of our funding is that there is an emphasis on kind of quick deliverability under the program. So, you know, when funding gets allocated to a project, it needs to be expended within five years. So we kind of want to see if someone's coming to us with a proposal that, you know, they've started to do coordination needed for that and planning work. Okay, great. All right, thanks, Ben. I think I think sure. several should do a few now on the, on Metro's program. Um, can you provide information on the actual usage of the fifty thousand dollars in toll credits LA Metro has awarded? So the way the the toll credits work is an account holder can have num could have multiple tap cards registered to that account. So let's say I drive the express lanes, but I have you know, a household who, use tra who uses transit. So multiple transit cards can be tied to an account. But um, all the way till um, the end of 2018, we had about 750,000 qualifying transit trips that were taken. So the, the tolls that these customers get back onto their account, they can use um, on the express lanes. They don't expire. It's a $5 toll credit. Um, that they can use, you know, if they're driving solo on the express lanes. And the way we basically calculate that is our back office operator, um, we do a file transfer with the, the, the TAP department at Metro, and we basically see which um, trips were taken on the qualifying transit line. And then once they get 16 one-way trips, the toll credit is added onto the customer's account. Okay, thank you. Okay, I know you, you spoke a little bit about the um, low-income assistance and equity. There was a question here, just I guess, generally about the, um, the perception, pushback. the pushback related to uh, folks that have difficulty paying for the toll or using the hot lane. Has that been in, presented any so issues? On, honestly, we haven't really had any pushback. I wasn't with the department when it first went live. So when they were doing some of the, um, you know, the community events to get feedback from the people living in that, in that area. So I'm not 100% sure, but recently we did decrease our violation rates um, to make it easier for commuters if they did want to use the express lanes. Um, before, if you got into the lane without a transponder or an account, it was $25 plus the toll. And starting January, we decreased that $25 fee to only $4, basically giving commuters um, the chance to get in, you know, if they were running late or, um, you know, they had an appointment to get to. So if they got in, the violation would only be $4 plus the toll. And that way we thought, you know, it would be easier for um, people to use the lane if they need it. And that way um, it helps with the pushback as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, Metro, did you mention the, the numbers of uh, folks that have taken advantage of that, of the $5 credit? So, um, I mean, we've given about over 180000 in rewards. Um, it's because we just transitioned to a new back office operator, it's a little bit hard for me to get the data right now because they haven't synced the two systems together. But um, at the end of 2018, we had given um, up to 180,000 in rewards for the toll credits for the transit rewards. Thank you. A question on I think Eric provided a response, but the three plus carpools and the means of identifying that and. Um, Like Eric said, that the Bay Area is using those flexible transponders. Anyone else want to comment about that? I mean, we use the the flex as well, and um, 
hopefully in a few months we'll be implementing the occupancy detection system where we can actually verify and see if you know there are two or three people in the car. Okay, great. So that's what we're working on next. Yeah. And um, I guess Mary, just help me if, <laughs> if we've crossed over into your uh, area because they didn't identify. Is there any independent verification of the occupancy other than the driver, which which you just mentioned? So with the technology that you're moving towards, um, is there anything more? I haven't seen much on the. Um, but yeah, I haven't seen much on the enforcement side of how how they're going to verify the three plus pools, but as as you see in the chat, there is a flex transponder, so you can indicate how many people are in your vehicle. Um, and in addition, there may be some other technology being used, cameras. I think somebody mentioned an app. I did a long time ago see, and this wasn't just about the express lanes, but just carpool lanes in general, um, how to better uh, monitor the use of that lane and verify that people are indeed carpooling. Um, instead of just relying on CHP, uh, maybe using some sort of app. Um, and I, I would imagine that a lot of the carpooling apps that are being used right now might have some sort of interest in working with uh, local and state governments to, to make sure that people aren't cheating the system. Yeah. Good point. Could be some opportunities there, partner. Um, question, uh, Mary, about about the three dollar maximum toll and whether or not there was any analysis of how that how, you know, how price sensitive um, folks would be to, to that level of, of a toll. So we commute.org isn't involved in the toll policy. Uh, the joint powers authority that owns the lane sets the policy and I believe it's still a work in progress. Um, I don't think that one to three dollar per mile is officially set. As my colleague Kim has answered in the chat already, uh, they are currently doing an equity study, so uh, the effect of the express lanes on low-income communities and how uh, the express lanes can be more equitable. So I would imagine a price sensitivity study is, is part of that, um, but I, otherwise I, I can't really speak to that. Thank you. Um, looks like Jesse Glazer, who's in our FH Library Southern California office, is um, boots on the ground there. He, he pointed out it got back up, back to this question of the self -de declaration of occupants, and um, just point out that's that's an issue. Uh, very high violation rate in in um, Southern California, at least. Jim, do yes, Jesse is correct. That's why we're pushing for the. ODS system. Right. Okay, this is kind of more of a general, I don't know, Eric. Um, I'll, 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 uh, I'll cover this one, Eric, and then we'll, if you want to jump in. Um, but it's just a general question on the, the question of the extent to which the introduction of a price management lane affects HOV use. I know we've got my colleague Can Andrew and Jacobson, Greg Jones online, if they want to type response to that. But any of our presenters have um, thoughts on okay. the extent to which um, we're moving towards, moving from HOV to, to a, a price lane, what kind of effect that's had on um, HOV usage or this is Ben. It'll be interesting to see for the 395 corridor um, how that looks. We did a set of baseline counts in 2019, and we'll be doing another one in 2021 um, after you know the conversion of the what had been HOV lanes to hot lanes. Um, we kind of our gut expectation is there probably won't be as much shift in this corridor in terms of um, mode shift. Maybe some toward transit since there are some additional options, but um, there was pretty strong HOV use in that corridor already and probably wouldn't, you know, may or may not be actually be going up as a result of tolling. Okay. 
I mean, for Thank Metro, you. we definitely um, did see the carpooling increase. Um, but at this time, because we have a lot of cheaters, it's a little bit hard for us to tell who's actually carpooling and who is a solo driver. So we're, we will be doing some before and after studies once we implement the occupancy detection system just to see if our numbers are accurate. Okay, thank you. And then, yeah, as I say, Greg um, kind of reminded, reminded us that Eric, Eric did mention an ongoing project, and that's the subject that he'll be covering in this um, in that work. Eric, do you want to you want to comment on that more, or just uh, jump in and field these last few if you're on? Coming through pretty clear to me. I'm going to jump in, and, and Jim, somebody let me know if the quality is bad. I've been trying to do it through the phone, but um, can you hear me now? Okay. All right. Yeah, as it was mentioned, actually the topic of this webinar is the topic of a of a federal highway study that's being um, overseen by Greg Jones in the resource office. And so a lot of these questions that we're bringing up right now are really at the heart of that um, of that research. For example, um, we've just asked the question of the impact of of HOT on on carpooling, and one of the issues that's come up is whether or not uh, occupancy counts, direct visual uh, I mean, occupancy I know counts we are being Metro done or do whether it's transponder counts. data is being used to try to estimate the number of car pullers. Um, Does anybody want to comment on and that the use us of in the past, observation but again, um, through occupancy you know, counts they would versus derived their, data from um, transponder data? They saw people counting data? them. So for, for us, we're waiting for the technology to be installed to have a more um, better idea of where our carpoolers stand. Yeah, it's been actual, like, in-person counts or, you know, counters doing the counting in the um, cases I mentioned. And actually, I meant to mention for I-66, too, with the conversion of that from HOV restrictions to ben, is hot, that part of there what you're really hoping to do, was not uh, too much change to in the proportion counts? of HOVs and actually um, the share of HOV3 and van pool trips in the corridor went up, I think partly as a result of some additional van pool incentives that the state was offering too. Excellent, excellent. Again, my apologies. There's some. I'm still having some audio. Um, so that um, uh, there's a great question that came up here a little bit later. Um, uh, I know Metro is, Express Lines do does not. We don't have, have a percentage where we like for mode the, shift um, or mode shares that need to occur in, our patterns or mode, but, uh, in order I mean, to deem we, the express lanes. We do everything in our power uh, by success. marketing Persons every year. Put mode shift, and, you know, mode on the low income assistance plan, we market the transit rewards to make sure you know those those commuters that can take transit, um, take transit. I mean, our net toll revenue grant program, we make improvements on different modes within a three mile radius of the express lanes, you know, to help the, the commuters. So I think we're doing everything in our power to help shift the mode, but we don't have a set percentage that deems it a success or not. And similar in San Mateo County, I haven't seen any mode shift goals. Um, it's more uh, an emphasis on the, the speed that will be achieved in the express lanes, as Kim pointed out again in the chat, 45 miles per hour or greater. Thank you. Yeah, and we don't have a Anybody set else? target either. Each of our funding rounds is kind of competitive within itself. So, you know, the strongest projects that best meet the improvement goals of the corridor are the ones that 
within the available funding are the ones that get funded. Great. You and Kim are a good team, Mary. So I would I would conclude that while there may be uh, generalized goals of person throughput mode shift, either either specific to the managed lanes or within the regional long range plan, there are seldom. It sounds like there are seldom numeric targets. So that was a great uh, question, Jim. Were you able to ask the question about the impact of post COVID, COVID, post COVID, <laughs> post COVID on um, on carpooling and Eric, transit use uh, out in managed again. lanes? Yeah, we covered that, Eric, to the extent that folks can been uh, looking at crystal ball, but um, yeah, we, we touched on that. Let me ask it one more time and I'll put it in the chat. Jim, were you able to ask about the impact, the, imp uh, the post COVID environment and what it might do for carpooling and transit in managed lanes? Okay, all right. I can say for I-66, for now, uh, I've got a couple of um, the HOV definition uh, had been two plus. But, uh, one specific when polling one, went into effect, did HOV threes go um, up at this point, because it's still the two HOV plus. definition was Starting changed in from two to three when pricing when was introduced. Kind of more know um, about traditional reversible the impact hot lanes outside the beltway go into effect. HOV, the HOV requirement will go up to three plus um, in the corridor. So. Um, there has been definitely some effort to, you know, make people aware of that. So for and metric be plus lane. reason for some of the effect. Sorry, Ben, I thought you were done. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm done. Sorry. Go ahead. No more. I was going to say for the express lanes, um, it's two plus, um, so two or more is three on the 110 but on the 10, we have three or more free during peak hours. And, so and just, during just off so peak, you... it's two or more. But again, unfortunately, right, so... um, you know, we've noticed a lot of cheaters. And that that's why, um, you know, I really, we really can't tell if people are really carpooling with three or more people. It's a little bit hard for us to do enforcement on the 10 because of the way the lanes are laid out. and. DHT, and um, that's why we're really hopeful for the technology to be installed. And then in San Mateo County, okay, I was just going to say that the express lanes aren't in operation yet. It won't be until 2022. But I was I was going to say that I think there's there could and be some just to let everyone know work that, for uh, Caltrans is doing a little bit of work in, in Southern California. More three person pools. And I've seen some agencies in areas of the country Wait, with programs um, incentives for if you have an existing two person pool, you get a bonus if you introduce a third person to your carpool. So there's work to be done in that area. Um, yeah. I mean, I can give some numbers, for example, on the 110, the way our occupancy. Go ahead. I was just going to say, for example, on the 110, the way our occupancy split is, is, you know, 45% of our trips are SOV, and then HOV2 Excellent. is 32%, just to let you know, and Caltrans HOV3 in Southern California. is 23%. But this number, again, you know, um, we we take from what customers put on their transponder. Ahead, so. And for the 10, um, we have 40% that are HOV3, 15% that are HOV2, and 45% that are SOV. So that's how we see the mode split by quarter.
Um, mercifully, we have not had to recall any grants. We okay. had enough funding. Um, I think uh, Jesse is um, going to provide some answers to what I just typed in past some years. Background. To so I have a uh, over what was a pretty. Um, oh, there was one more question. Are there are any grants having to be recalled, revenues, particularly for you, Ben, due to COVID-related revenue are, shortfalls? We um, are delaying the, the approval of our next two-year program of projects simply because it is extremely challenging to estimate how much revenue might be available at this time. Um, so that is that is kind of delaying things going forward. Um, for our other corridor, 395.95, the funds come from a um, concessionaire payment to the state. And uh, we were very happy to see in the news recently that the concessionaire indicated they plan to make their payment this fall as expected. So. You know, we're not really expecting as much of an impact in that corridor. Um, at this time, we don't we don't plan on recalling any projects that we've allocated money to. Um, we are not planning on having a round three natural revenue grant because we will be using the funds to expand express lanes to other corridors, but. There's been no discussion of recalling any project. Mary or Silva? And I haven't heard anything about any shortfalls not affecting the project. Excellent. We have less than 10 minutes left. At the end, I'm going to ask Deborah to answer the couple of questions about the slides and the recording um, details. But the question I'd like to um, ask of everybody is, we've now learned of the benefits of enhancing alternative mode and uh, contemporary travel demand management in managed lanes. You've all given great examples of what you're currently doing if you had uh, uh, the ability to add strategies or what strategies do you think that could work that we just haven't tried yet but maybe ought to be thinking about? I don't about know that it's something that area. people aren't thinking about, but, you know, like I said, for us, part of the challenge is just moving away, you know, diversifying our set of projects from kind of bread and butter bus services, especially, you know, when the market was kind of looking saturated already and now thanks to COVID, it very, 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 very likely is into, you know, how do we as a funder um, kind of create more room for, you know, more deployments of advanced technology. Um, of course, that's something, you know, any sort of shared ride services we've been talking about is something that's going to be kind of affected by COVID. But, you know, in the interest of kind of diversifying our portfolio projects going forward, how can we make more room for that sort of innovation? I mean, for us, we always look at um, using technology as a way to promote alternative modes. Um, it's Thank just you. You know, it's easy for people to get into their cars and drive. And so, so we Mary, find you, ways, if, you know, to make you it do anything easy in for commuters to, to find to, alternative uh, to options. Bolster so modes, I know, you know, we're uh, looking at an do? app that hopefully we can integrate with, you know, the bike share, with TAP, um, which is our bus, the bus service that's provided by Metro. So we're looking at different ways that technology um, can can help. It's just, it's, it's hard, I mean, especially, in LA County, it's hard to get people out of their cars. Um, yeah, I mean, it sounds like Silva's touching on mobility as a service, which is like one app that one. Uh, I'll just keep going, Eric. Uh, one app that consolidates all people's options and making it really easy for them to make choices that are 
you know, choosing Excellent. alternative modes well, we and making have those a... be, seem more attractive than getting in your car and getting stuck in traffic for hours on end. Yep. Thank you. And the final question that was brought up is the probably a great topic for another webinar, which is the use of the outside shoulder as a carpool lane or even as a uh, priced lane, which there's some demonstrations in the Twin Cities, so that might be a good uh, future discussion. I want to apologize for my end with the uh, quality. We've been having terrible internet problems here for some strange reason, um, and I really apologize for the quality. I thank the speakers uh, for their great work, diligence in putting together great presentations, uh, for Jim stepping in with the Q&A, and um, I just want to thank everybody okay. that's been listening, and I'd ask if maybe um, uh, Deborah could just answer those couple of questions about the, the timing of uh, the uh, slides and the okay, recording, thanks, Eric. and I will try These to add notes slides to for this presentation from so each presenter will be available on the say. NOCOE website Deborah? more than likely Monday, so check then, and the recording will also be available, so check on the in-demand portion you see the of the website, and everything from today should be there. Thank you, Deborah. Jim. So thank you all for participating. Thank you. Uh, thank you. everyone. Again, apologies. Thanks. Have a great uh, rest of your Thursday. And again, thank you again. Don't forget there's